Hey guys, and welcome to the second video in the Smart Contract Security Tutorial Series. In this video, I'd like to talk about re-entrancy attacks. Now, these are one of the most destructive attack vectors out there where malicious smart contracts can literally drain all the funds from the victim contract. We'll run a sample of a re-entrancy attack to learn how it works, and then talk about a few different ways that you can protect your code from these kind of attacks. So if that sounds good, stick around and let's do it. Okay, so just a brief overview of how re-entrancy attacks work. These kind of attacks happen when malicious contracts, we'll call them attacker contracts, call victim contracts in such a way that they gain more control over code execution than was ever intended, disrupting the intended state of the victim contract and manipulating it in unexpected ways. For example, the attacker can call a withdrawal function on a victim contract, which then sends funds to the attacker. So far, this is just as intended. But the attacker then gains control of code execution via its fallback or receive function and is able to recursively call the victim's withdrawal function over and over again before the victim has a chance to update its account balances to reflect the withdrawal. And this continues until the attacker has effectively drained the victim of all of its funds. This was the very same attack used in the infamous DAO attack of 2016 in which $60 million in Ether was stolen and resulted in the controversial forking of the Ethereum blockchain into Ethereum and Ethereum Classic in order to return the stolen funds. Let's take a look at an example of a re-entrancy attack in action to get a better understanding of how this works. All right, so in my Remix editor, I've got two smart contracts here. One is the Ether Bank smart contract. This is gonna be the victim smart contract, and then I've got some attacker code right over here. So we'll take a look at each one briefly, and uh, I'm going to make this code available uh, via my GitHub in a uh, link in the description. So I definitely encourage you guys to download this code and just kind of go through it line by line, line and really study it until you understand exactly how this attack works. Um, but so just to give a brief rundown of how this code works, uh, it's an Ether savings account. So we have a mapping of addresses to balances, just to keep track of all of the accounts in the bank, so to speak. Then we have a simple deposit function, which allows uh, basically a user to send in some amount of ether, and then their balance gets updated in the above mapping. And then we have a simple withdrawal function, and this is a really simplified withdrawal function in that we don't even have any sort of parameter that specifies how much to withdraw. It just withdraws the entire balance of the given account. Okay, so just to keep things simple for this example. And I've got some logging in here because this is the function that the attacker is going to end up calling recursively until the entire smart contract balance is drained. And then I've just got a utility function down here, get balance, just so we can check it um, at any time during our testing to see what's going on. All right, next to the attacker contract. So we see that um, basically this contract is going to call the other contract, the Ether Bank contract. So in order to do that, it's got to define an interface with the functions that it's going to call you know, from the other contract. Then we define the attacker contract down below. Um, in the constructor, we pass in the address of the contract that we're going to want to talk to and call functions on. And we set the owner just because we have some of these functions restricted to owner only. All right, then we have the attack function. So what's happening here is first, the attacker is actually making a deposit into the bank. And the reason for that is because in the withdrawal function, it checks to make sure that, that there is some sort of balance associated with the address that's invoking withdrawal. So you have, to, um, you, know, you have to be part of the bank, so to speak, or you have to be a member of the bank and have deposited some sort of money in order to withdraw. Makes sense, right? Okay, so then, however, it immediately invokes the withdrawal function. Now, the withdrawal function, if I go back to EtherBank, on line 27 here, it actually, this is the line where it actually sends the Ether to the message.sender, which is the, the account that's invoking the withdrawal, okay? After that, it updates the balances in our mapping above to reflect that withdrawal. However, what we're going to see happen is that in this receive function, which is sort of a smart contracts callback for that executes whenever they receive any sort of funds, 
here's where our attacker gains control over execution and is able to call withdrawal again and again. And the reason it's able to do this is because the victim has not yet updated the balances to reflect the withdrawal. So it's able to pass the require check and recursively call withdrawal. All right. So if you notice on line 25, there's a check uh, to see if the bank has any money at all. And it, as long as it does, it's going to keep on recursively calling withdrawal. And once it's completely drained, so you see here on line 29, we're console logging victim account drained. Here's where on line 30, we transfer all of the funds from the attacker smart contract to the attacker's wallet, okay, which is owner. So at that point, we log victim account drained, and we should see a zero balance in the bank, and all of the funds that were previously in the bank are now in the wallet of the owner of the attacker account. All right, so let's go ahead and run this attack and see what it looks like. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I wanna make sure that this ether bank is compiled. Okay, and then I'm gonna make sure this is selected under contract here and go ahead and deploy that. Okay, and I can see that my EtherBank smart contract is now deployed. So let's check the balance. The initial balance should be zero. And now let's go ahead and have a couple of the accounts make some deposits. So I'll start with the initial account that deployed the smart contract. And um, let's change this to Ether to make it just a little bit easier to kind of see things. So let's say 10 Ether and deposit. Now let's just check to make sure that the uh, bank's yep, been incremented too. So the entire smart contra contract now has a balance of 10 Ether. So we'll do this uh, one or two more times. All right, I'll select the second account. We'll also deposit 10 Ether. Okay, so now total balance is up to 20. And let's just do it one more time. So I'll, I'll select account number three and I'll also deposit 10 ether. Okay, great. So far it's working as a bank should. We've got three customers, they've all deposited 10 ether. The total value of the bank or of the ether bank smart contract is, is now 30 ether. Okay, let's go ahead and deploy our attacker account. So I'm gonna switch over to, or sorry, our attacker smart contract. So I'm just gonna make sure that this is compiled. All right. Now remember, in order to deploy the attacker smart contract, we need to pass into the constructor the address of the already deployed EtherBank smart contract. So we'll do that right here. And then I will, oops. Now I'm gonna make sure I select another account for the attacker, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and deploy that. And let me um, expand this a little bit so you guys can see the logging. Okay, so that deployment was successful. So let's scroll down a bit and expand our attacker smart contract. All right, now remember, our attack vector is gonna first deposit some money. So let's deposit two ether before it starts its recursive withdrawal. And that's, again, that's just so that the, the attacker message.sender um, or wallet address has an account established with the bank so that it can, in fact, invoke withdrawal. All right, I'm gonna clear out this logging and let's begin the attack. Withdrawal amount exceeds available balance. Okay, so I think what happened is I think my um, deposit amount some, for some reason got wiped out there. This is a common UI thing that kind of happens with, uh, oops, with Remix, it's happened to me a few times. Let's try that again. All right, attack. And there we go. So it looks like our attack has succeeded. And if you can see, each logging here represents one recursion or one pass through, one invocation of withdrawal. So if we look back at our console log output, we can really see what happened here. So if, you're, if you recall, we initially deposited 30 ether into the bank. Then the attacker deposited an additional two ether for a total of 32 ether in the bank. So when we started the attack, 
we recursively called withdrawal each time withdrawing two ether from the bank. Now, if you notice, the attacker balance always remains at two ether throughout the entire attack, and that's only because the, the victim never had a chance to update the state. They never had a chance to reset the balance of the, with, of the wallet address who initiated the withdrawal to zero. So throughout the duration of the entire attack, the bank still thinks that the attacker has a, an account balance of two ether. And if we scroll all the way to the end, we notice that's reflected in the final console log output. This just goes to show that the, the state of the contract, of the victim contract, has been disrupted. The bank still thinks that it has a, a value of two ether and that the attacker balance is also two ether. However, if we look back at the attacker's current balance, we see that that's not the case. Because we started with 100 ether, we then deposited two, which would leave us with a total of 98. And now we have just shy of 130, indicating that all 32 ether from the bank has been withdrawn and transferred to the attacker's account. All right, so let's talk about how we can protect our smart contracts from reentrancy attacks. So the attacker was able to recursively call the withdrawal function because the victim's withdrawal function transferred the funds before updating the account balances. So one strategy would be to update the account balances before we transfer funds. Okay, so if we invert the position of these two statements, now one thing we'll have to do is to create a temporary variable to hold the balance account, because if we're resetting it to zero, then we have nothing to send. So what we can do is, let's see, I'll create a temporary var variable. I'll say uint account balance equals balances of message.sender. Okay, and then I'll reference that in the actual transfer. That way, if somebody tries to recursively call the withdrawal function, the initial require check will fail, okay, because the account balance will be zero. So this check will fail right here. All right, and let's make sure that looks good. Got one extra parentheses here. Okay, great. All right, so let's check this out. I'm gonna, okay, we've, go, we've went ahead and compiled EtherBank, so let's redeploy that. And again, I'm gonna make sure the first account is selected, and I'm gonna make sure the right contract is selected, and let's go ahead and deploy. Okay, perfect. So let's add some deposits here. I'll do 10 again. And if we expand our deployed contract, we can invoke deposit. And then let's check and make sure our bank account balance is also 10. Great. And let's just do one more for the fun of it. We've got two customers. Deposit and make sure that the contract balance is 20. Okay, perfect. So let's go ahead and recompile our attacker code. Even though we haven't made any changes, sometimes I find that you've got to recompile it so it shows up in the drop down here. So there we go. Okay, now remember we've got to grab the address of our ether bank in order to deploy our attacker contract. So I'll make sure that the attacker account is selected. I'll, I'll, I'll select a new account for the attacker, just so it's a little bit easier to see. All right, we've deployed that. Now remember, we need an initial deposit, so again, I'll enter two ether. And let's go down and find our attacker smart contract. All right, and let's go ahead and run our attack and see what happens here. I'm gonna go ahead and clear the console. All right, and we can see that that attack is now failing due to our changes, so that's a very good thing. And we see the error message down here, address unable to send value recipient may have reverted. So what we're seeing here basically is that the attack failed, the entire transaction was reverted, and all of the account balances are left the same as they were before the attack. Okay. And so if there's one takeaway from this little lesson here, it's that you know, it's really important to make sure that your contract is left in a consistent state or in the intended state 
before it makes any external calls to any other contracts or transfer of funds or anything like that. All right, so let's look at another way to protect against the reentrancy attack. So over the course of your programming, you know, even if you realize or you sort of intellectually know that you should keep your state updated before you call other contracts or before you transfer funds, Sometimes it can be hard to remember, or you know, if you have complex code, sometimes it can be hard to even spot reentrancy vulnerabilities. So in that case, if you have any doubts, you can use something called a reentrancy guard. And a reentrancy guard is another contract that you can inherit from that will automatically detect and prevent reentrancy attacks. The Open Zeppelin library provides one such reentrancy guard. All right, so what we're going to do now is remove our previous fix and instead fix the problem with the reentrancy guard. So I'm just going to sort of back out of these code changes that I just made and go back to what we had before. Okay, which is incorrect, but we're going to hope that the reentrancy guard will actually save us this time. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is we want to import the library from Open Zeppelin. So I'll say import at Open Zeppelin. Contracts, security slash reentrancy guard dot SOL. Okay, and I'll just take a second to make sure that looks correct. Security reentrancy guard. Okay, looks good. Now we just need to inherit from that. So we'll say Etherbank is, and we can copy the name of the contract right here and go ahead and save our file. All right, I just need to add a semicolon here. There we go. Now, the way the reentrancy guard works is that it provides an access modifier similar to the only owner access modifier that uh, you know we've seen in a couple of uh, videos here. Uh, this one makes sure that the entity calling the, the function is the owner. Similarly, we can use the non-reentrant access modifier that's provided through the reentrancy guard. So we don't see it in the code, but it's coming through in our inheritance. So what we need to do is go down to our withdrawal function. And right after our external visibility um, identifier, we'll say non reentrant, just like that. Non reentrant. Okay, and let's go ahead and save that and run the exploit again. Okay, so first I've got to, let's recompile this code. And we'll go ahead and select account number one and redeploy it. And make sure that the contract, the correct contract is selected. So Etherbank and deploy. Okay, so far so good. I'll expand that and, um, you know, I'll just I think I'll just do one deposit from one account. We really only need one to test this, so I'll go ahead and do deposit. And let's just verify that the smart contract balance is now 20. Looking good. All right, so next I'm gonna go over to the attacker account and we'll just recompile that. And I will go ahead and select the attacker account from the dropdown. Yeah, I'll choose a new attacker. There we go. And we need to copy our Etherbank address. Copy that into the constructor function. And make sure we got the right contract selected. Yep, looks like we do. And did that change or was it just me? Let me just make sure. There we go. Okay. And let's deploy that. All right. So far, so good. All right. And uh, let's go ahead and add our value here. So we'll, again, we'll deposit to Ether, and let's go ahead and run the attack. All right, great. So as we can see, the attack again failed. Uh, we've got the same error message that we saw before when we manually fixed the reentrancy attack. So as you can see, the, uh, the reentrancy guard is a great way, another great way to prevent these kind of attacks. But, you know, again, I'll, I'll stress that, like, the main takeaway of this lesson is just to think about the order of your statements and really make sure that your contract is in its intended state 
before doing any side effects, performing any external calls, or especially sending funds. All right, well, uh, that's all I've got for this video, so hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to subscribe to the channel if you guys are enjoying this content and would like to be notified of my future videos. Other than that, hope to see you in the next one, and take it easy. Bye. Thank you.